Well, I hope you like bar charts, because I got plenty of those for you today, because it's finally time to share the results of the benchmarks for the AMD and Intel budget gaming builds. Hello everybody and welcome to Tech Uploaded, I'm Chris, and today is a day that has been a long time coming. I feel like this project has been dragging on forever. It dates back to before the Pentium G3258 was even released, but when that chip was announced and it was uh, announced around 75 bucks, I thought, you know, this is the first time Intel's had a really compelling budget option out there because the chip is unlocked. So. You know, I got to thinking, I'm like, AMD's had some stuff out there for quite a while that kind of fell into this category. So why not do a little head-to-head? -head? And I set a budget of, you know, anywhere between seven and 800 bucks and decided to do two different budget gaming builds. One that's AMD, one that's Intel. And for the AMD, I went AMD and AMD with an AMD Athlon X4 760K and an AMD R9 270. And then on the Intel side, I went for the Pentium 20th Anniversary Edition G3258 and paired that with the GTX 750 Ti. For the benchmarks, I decided to be traditional and a little non-traditional at the same time. So what I did is I did your usual and customary. So I did the synthetic benchmarks and some gaming benchmarks and all that good stuff and compared the systems at stock and at overclock. And then I thought, you know, that's kind of boring. So let's compare some more components. So I took the, uh, the results, looked at them and said, all right, the G3258 seems to be the stronger processor overall between the two, but it's not doing the best in some benchmarks, and I think it's because of the 750 Ti. So I took the R9 270 and I threw it in the Intel system, and then I uh, decided to throw a 780 in there too, because why not? And ran some benchmarks with that to see just how much things improved, uh, putting that card in there, and I pitted it directly against the 750 to see where some of the weaknesses may be in that card. Now, granted, the 750 is a cheaper option, it's a little slower clock, and it's much quieter, but we'll get to that later. And then finally, I wanted to really stress the CPUs and see if I could determine once and for all which one I felt was uh, the strongest of the two. So I took that 780, and I went ahead and put it in the systems, both of them, and ran some benchmarks to see which one actually was able to draw the most performance from the CPU, and pretty much eliminated the GPU bottleneck from the equation. So with all that said, here's the standards I used for the benchmarks. I repeated the same scene and games for every single benchmark. Uh, Tomb Raider had a, has a built-in benchmark utility, so I went ahead and used that, but for all the other ones, I did the same scene over and over again. So especially in Borderlands, I've gotten really good at one particular scene in the game. But what I did is I tested everything at stock, and then for the, all of the overclock benchmarks, not only did I overclock the CPU, so I got 4.4 on the X4 Athlon 760K, and then I got 4.6, which I was really impressed with, on the G3258. And then I went ahead and I took the GPUs and I overclocked them as far as I could go without doing any kind of overvolting or hacking or anything like that. So I got like 150 megahertz on the actual bus added to the R9270 and then 100 megahertz on the memory, whereas the 750Ti not having a six pin auxiliary power and being the reference design with one fan, I was only able to do 50 megahertz on uh, the bus and 50 megahertz on the memory. So obviously it didn't get as much of an overclock and I think that's why it suffered a little bit as well. But all that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the benchmarks. Now you're gonna probably have to pause from time to time because you only got seven seconds on each slide, but I didn't want to be too boring and drag it out. So let's get to it.
So there you go, the results of the benchmarks. Now I know that was a whole lot of data to be thrown at you all at one time, but I wanted to be thorough. And I had the added benefit of being able to swap out components and throw a 780 in there and do all kinds of fun stuff. So I took advantage of it, why not? And pretty much the conclusion I came to was the Pentium G3258 is the better performer of the two CPUs, while the R9 270, I feel, is the better GPU. Now, before I go any further, a couple of points here. If sound is an issue, and you don't like things to be noisy, the particular one that I use, the Sapphire R9 270 with uh, dual fans, that was very noisy, incredibly noisy. I actually had to take a uh, cable tie and cram it in between the little plastic shroud over the fans and the actual heat sink that was in there because they were they were rubbing up against each other at just the wrong frequency and creating a really loud vi vibration, vibrating sound. That quieted things down a little bit, but overall it was really, really noticeable when that thing kicked up, while the 750Ti, we had stayed pretty quiet. Now for the CPU, the results were pretty much what I expected. The single core performance on the G3258 was better. Of course, it's an Intel chip, that's how it goes. But in things like Watch Dogs, where you know, the game is really CPU dependent and it can take advantage of multiple cores, that's where you see the uh, Athlon X4760K pull ahead because it just had more cores to work with. And it was a, the only title that really had a significant gain over the Pentium chip. Um, and that game really, I mean, even with the 780, it didn't pull ahead that much with that card because the card was being bottlenecked so badly by the CPU. So that's that's one title that really uh, just went to show where games might be going down the road and where you know a budget gaming build might bottleneck you at some point. But overall, all the other titles, uh, I was really impressed with the performance I was getting with the R9 270, and I was uh, really impressed with how close some of the benchmarks were to my 4790K with the G3258 and a 780 in there. I mean, it was really impressing me. Games that, you know, are just one or two threads, you know, that 4.6 gigahertz overclock, it was doing its work, it was doing its business, and it really, really was impressive. So, you know, I have to say, I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised by how well everything worked out there. And, you know, for 750-ish dollars right now, these systems are running, I think the AMD's around 780, and the Intel's around like 745. That's not bad. If you shop wisely, you can get either one of these for around 750. Now, what I would do is I would take the uh, PC part picker list that I have down in the description and kind of go off of there. My suggestions would be use a different case because I'm looking at them now and I'm kind of giving them that dirty look because those cases were not fun to build in. So find something a little bit better than that. Uh, they, they were the spec 01 from Corsair. And I would actually take the R9 270 and swap it for the 750Ti if noise isn't too much of an issue for you and pair that with the G3258. I think that's gonna be your best bang for the buck for 750 to $800. Okay, now before everybody gets on my case about calling this a budget build, first off, it's a budget gaming build. I want you to be able to run games, which as you can see from the benchmark, some of these games are very playable at maximum settings and turning things down just a few ticks on a lot of them is gonna get you up to that magical 60 frame per second number. Are you gonna be running you know, 144 hertz monitor and, and you know, being able to get the full frame rate out of that? No, it's a budget gaming build. But considering that this system behind me with a 4790K and a 780Ti is $2,300, 750 to 800 bucks doesn't seem so bad. It's all relative. Now, with all that said, some of the challenges with this particular uh, experiment. The Z97 board was actually really pleasant to work with, even though it was entry level, it was under $100, and it's an ASRock board, which I don't, haven't done a whole lot with. I usually use those more on like a server level side, because they do offer some really compelling options there. But for like a consumer level board, this was my first ASRock experience, and I was really pleased with it. It was a very value-oriented board. It was easy to overclock that G3258. Everything made sense. Everything was laid out well. Cannot say the same thing about the uh, A78 chipset that was on the MSI board. Had some issues with that. So number one, when you go into the BIOS, or UEFI, I'm still living in the old days, you couldn't, you couldn't overclock it in there. And when you went into the overclocking tuner, it said, hey, you're not running an A-series APU, so we're not gonna let you do anything in here. You're screwed. So it wouldn't let me change the base clock, uh, it wouldn't let me change the multiplier, and it wouldn't let me change the voltage. So pretty much, wouldn't let me do anything. However, when I went into Windows, I was able to run the AMD Overdrive software and do the automatic tuning. And when I did that, all of a sudden, boom, magically, it did the uh, automatic overclock and went to 4.4. And then looking online, 
I'm realizing with that chip, 4.4 is pretty good. So I can't complain too much there, but I would really have rather done it in the UEFI because you're reliant on that software booting up every time with your computer to maintain that overclock. So that's kind of a bummer, but you know, looking back, maybe I would have went with an A88X board for, you know, 20 or 30 more bucks. But at the time, you know, I thought that would be the better deal. But I may suggest to you, if you're going to use this chip, go for an A88X board. I think you're just going to get a better overclocking experience. So I know I took forever to finally get this video done, but I think it was worth it. I was very thorough with my benchmarks. I made sure that everything made sense. Uh, I was able to swap out components and check out different things and really uh, answer a lot of questions for myself. I mean, it was kind of a selfish video. I was curious and I wanted to uh, feed my curiosity. So hopefully it uh, does something for you as well. And if it does, please go ahead and click on that subscribe button. You can also follow me on Twitter over at Tech Uploaded. And, um, you know, if you have a question or a comment and you really want me to see it, please go ahead and email me at techuploaded at gmail.com. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Or you can find me on Facebook over at Tech Uploaded. You know the drill. Don't be a stranger. Check back soon.